If you will, let's uh, take our Bibles. We're going to start in 2 Samuel 12 and uh, verse number 14 for our study this evening. And uh, then we're going to go over to Psalm 51 and uh, spend the most of our time going through that psalm. Uh, I think it's important for us to do that. We've been uh, studying about David's sin from uh, chapter 11 of 2 Samuel. And uh, we talked about it and looked at it pretty in depth. And uh, hopefully it has reminded us and emphasized to us the serious nature of sin and just how terrible and, and ugly and you know, dark and, and all of those things, you know, the, the terrible consequences of sin. Um, and we tried to emphasize that because, of course, the Bible does. And that God wants us to know and to understand just how terrible sin is. And certainly David's sin is no exception to that. We also, of course, have focused on chapter 12 and talked about David's repentance and uh, how when he was confronted with his sin after trying to hide it and to cover it up, he acknowledged that he was wrong. He admitted, I have sinned and sought uh, forgiveness. Tonight we're going to talk about David's restoration and we want to see the other side of this story. And even though there's the, the sadness and the sorrow that comes with sin, there's also joy because this ultimately is a story about God's mercy and his grace. If you remember when we studied just a few weeks ago from chapter 7 of 2 Samuel, God made a covenant with David, and we talked about how that covenant was a promise that through his bloodline, the Messiah would come into the world and build a house for God. And that wasn't the physical temple, but the spiritual temple, which is the church. And one of the key words in that covenant to David was that it would be a covenant of mercy. And this is before David had committed this sin, but God knew that David would be in need of his mercy. And the covenant included God's mercy. If not, where would David be? Where would God's plan of salvation be? Where would we be without the mercy of God? And that's an important thing to remember. And the other side of this story is God's great mercy toward David. And we want to focus in on that tonight. Now, to get us to that point, I want us to read verse 14 beginning in 2 Samuel 12 and talk about the results of David's sin and the sorrow that he went through. And then we'll talk about the joy from Psalm 51. So verse 14 says, you remember verse 13, David said, I have sinned. And Nathan said, uh, the Lord also hath put away thy sin, thou shalt not die. Now verse 14, how be it, because by this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. And Nathan departed unto his house, and the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife bare unto David, and it was very sick. David therefore besought God for the child, and David fasted and went in and lay all night upon the earth. And the elders of his house arose and went to him to raise him up from the earth, but he would not. Neither did he eat bread with them. And it came to pass on the seventh day that the child died. And the servants of David feared to tell him that the child was dead. For they said, Behold, while the child was yet alive, we spake unto him, and he would not hearken unto our voice. How will he then vex himself if we tell him that the child is dead? But when David saw that his servants whispered, David perceived that the child was dead. Therefore David said unto his servants, Is the child dead? And they said, He is dead. Then David arose from the earth, and washed, and anointed himself, and changed his apparel, and came into the house of the Lord, and worshipped. Then he came to his own house, and when he, re uh, when, when he required, they set bread before him, and he did eat. Then said his servants unto him, What thing is this that thou hast done? Thou didst fast and weep for the child while it was alive, but when the child was dead, thou didst rise and eat bread. And he said, While the child was yet alive, I fasted and wept, for I said, Who can tell whether God will be gracious to me that the child may live? But now he is dead. Wherefore should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he shall not return unto me. And so we read here about David's tremendous sorrow over the sickness of, of this child. And again, it reminds us of, number one, the terrible consequences of sin. And number two, the sorrow of God when he gave his son to pay the price for our sins, for the sins of the world. And we learn here that in spite of David's repentance, <clears throat> excuse me, and in spite of his forgiveness, 
there were still consequences to his sin. And this newborn child, of course, became very sick, and then after seven days, of course, he died. But the key thing to notice here is that during the time of his sickness for that week, David, of course, is enduring tremendous grief and sorrow uh, on, on his account, on account of this child, and because David knows that his sins are responsible. And so he doesn't eat, he's fasting, he, he goes in and lays down on the floor uh, in a, a state of mourning, but also a state of, of prayer, asking God for the life of this child. So for an entire week, David is agonizing in his spirit, praying for this child to be de delivered. And he does this because he said, you know, who knows if the Lord will be gracious unto me. So David understood the grace of God and that as long as there is life, there is hope, and there's hope because of God's grace. And, uh, of course, God didn't spare the life of this child. He died, but it didn't cause David to doubt the grace of God. And so once the child had died, David arose and he cleaned himself. And the first thing that he did, of course, was put on clean clothes and he went to the temple and he worshiped. So David didn't turn from God because of these bad things that had happened. He recognized his role and his responsibility and, and his sins. And he also recognized the justice of God. And so David still trusted in God. He worshiped God. And he also had the proper understanding of death. He knew that his, his child, his infant son, had died, but he knew where that child had gone. It had gone to be with the Lord. And David understood that he couldn't bring him back from the dead, but he could go to where that child was. David could live his life in such a way that when he died, he would also go to be with the Lord, and he could be reunited with his son. And so once the child died, David's mourning, his grief, ended in the sense that he was no longer, you know, agonizing, praying for the life of the child. And there was a peace that came to him because he knew where that child was. And I want us to, to remember that for a couple of reasons. Number one, of course, because it reminds us that everybody who is looking at David says he's got this backwards you're supposed to be, you know, eating while the child's alive because he's alive. And so maybe he's going to get better and everything is okay. And then when the child dies, that's when you fast and you weep and you mourn. So David was doing exactly the opposite. When the Bible talks about Christians who, who have hope when it comes to death and we face death differently than the world does, this is a perfect picture of that. David had the right understanding. He, he agonized when the child was alive and there was hope, and then there was a peace when the child died. And it's that way for us as well. We know our loved ones who are Christians, when they leave us, we know where they've gone. And we also know that they're in a place where there is perfect peace and uh, security and love and all the blessings of God because they're with him, and we know that we can be with them again. Now, there's two important things here. One is to remember that for us when it comes to understanding death, but also because of what we're going to talk about in just a minute from Psalm 51.5. Even though this child died because of David's sin, David didn't say that child was gone to hell. He didn't believe that that child inherited the guilt of his sin or that child had been born inheriting the sin of Adam. That child was safe, and it went to be with the Lord, and David could be reunited with him. And we're going to come back to that. But also, what we need to remember from this is that David knew, number one, that the child had gone to be with the Lord, and number two, that he, David, could go to be with the Lord. This shows us that David understood the forgiveness of sins, even though he'd committed you know, there was lust in his heart, there was covetousness after his neighbor's wife, he, he committed adultery, and then committed murder. Even though he'd done those terrible things, David said, I can go to him. He knew that he could be forgiven of those sins, and that when he died, he could go to heaven. There was no question about it. Even though he'd done terrible things that were wrong, he accepted the grace of God and recognized God's forgiveness. And we have to do the same. 
And so it's an important principle and one that we see demonstrated in the Psalms that we're going to look at tonight. So I want us to go to Psalm 51, and uh, we read a few verses from it in our last study, and just to point out a couple things about the, the terrible nature of sin. But I want us to look at the other side of it uh, tonight and, and to see the forgiveness and the hope and the joy that is found in this psalm. Even though it's sad and it's heartbreaking, there's also this, this promise of God. So before we do that, I want to real quick talk about verse number 5, which says, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Uh, this is the, the verse that the Calvinists used to try to teach us the doctrine of total hereditary depravity. Uh, they teach the idea and believe the idea that when Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, that sin and the guilt of it is passed on to all human beings. Every one of us, when we're born, we're born inheriting that sin. So we're born sinners, we're totally depraved, we have a sinful nature, and the only way that a person can be saved from that is if God sends the Holy Spirit to perform a direct operation on our hearts to remove that sin so we can accept the gospel. And it becomes this whole system uh, that they follow. I want to read just a couple of quotes to you from some of their writings just to make sure we understand. This is from the uh, Augsburg Confession written in 1530 A.D. It says, after Adam's fall, all men begotten after the common course of nature are born with sin, condemning and bringing eternal death. The Presbyterian Confession of Faith says, by this sin, which was eating the forbidden fruit, they, Adam and Eve, our first parents, fell from their original righteousness and so became dead in sin and wholly defiled in all the faculties and parts of soul and body. From this original corruption whereby we are utterly indisposed, disabled, and made opposite to all good and wholly inclined to all evil. So we're completely opposite of everything that is good and we're totally inclined to evil from the moment that we're born or even conceived. They say even in the womb this, this is how a baby is. So you can read, and you know, the doctrines continue, Calvin's Institutes, and on and on down throughout history. Calvin made a statement in one of his writings, and this is a quote. He said, there are some infants in hell, not a span long. You know, a span is the, the length from the, the end of your finger to your, to your elbow. Uh, so a baby, not even as long as your arm, they're in hell. Because they believe this doctrine that we're born totally depraved. And so this doctrine is not a Bible doctrine, but they find verses that seem to say something similar to what they believe, take them out of their context to try to convince people that this is what the Bible teaches. And this is the verse. There are others, but this is the one that they go to more than any other. And especially in modern translations of this verse, the NIV and some others, for example, it's worded in such a way as though it almost says exactly what they believe. But the verse says, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. And the best answer you know, to this verse is to, to very simply, I forget whoever first said this, but, but it illustrates you know, what the verse is saying. And, and that's this idea that if you're born in a cabbage patch, that doesn't make you a cabbage. This says, David says, I was shapen conceived in iniquity, uh, and in sin did my mother conceive me. If he were conceived in iniquity and sin, that didn't make him a sinner. Maybe it meant that the, the action about his conception, there was something sinful about that. When you look at David's history, he was ten generations from the sin of uh, Tamar with Judah. That was a, a relationship that was sinful, and ten generations, you know, the Old Testament says for ten generations you can't enter the temple and whatever. Well, David's the tenth generation, so there's a sense in which he was born in sin because of his heritage. But that didn't make him a sinner. The truth is what this verse is saying and what David is actually saying in the context, and if you just read the psalm, this is all that you would get from it. He's saying that his sin that he committed is so terrible that it's as if he's been a sinner from the moment he was conceived. His sin is so great that it covers and affects everything in his life. 
But the Bible is clear that we are not born sinners. We don't inherit sin from Adam and Eve or from our parents or grandparents or anyone else. By its very definition, sin is transgression of the law. 1 John 3 and verse 4. A baby cannot transgress the law. It doesn't even understand what law is or how to transgress it. James 4 and verse 17 talks about that if we uh, don't live in harmony with what God says, then we're committing sin. And again, children, babies, infants don't know how to do that. Zechariah 12 and verse 1 teaches us that God formeth the spirit within man. God is the one who creates the spirit in man, and he doesn't create something that is sinful. Acts 17, 29 teaches that we are the offspring of God. That was Paul's sermon in Athens. Matthew 18 and verse 3, you remember that Jesus said, Except you be converted and become as little children, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. So it was Jesus saying that we have to become like little, little demons, you know, little evil, sinful creatures? Of course not. Children are innocent and pure, and that's how we have to be in order to come into the kingdom. Ezekiel 18, verses 19 and 20 tells us, The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. So we're all individually responsible for our sins. In 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10, we're told, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every man may receive the things done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. So every man will receive what he has done in his body, not what Adam did in his, or Eve in hers, or our parents did, but what we have done. And that's the teaching of Scripture. It's up to us to decide whether we're saved or lost. The choices we make and the decisions we make, we are the ones who determine our eternal destiny. So this verse, Psalm 51.5, whatever it teaches, it doesn't teach that David was born in sin, born inheriting sin from Adam and Eve. And so again, David, is, you know, Paul talked about that he was the chief of sinners. Well, that doesn't mean that Paul's sin was greater than anyone else's. He was using it for emphasis to talk about how he understood his sins. And that's the same thing that David is doing here. We could all look at our lives and say that we're the chief of sinners and that our sins are so bad that it's as if we were born in sin. That's the principle that we're supposed to learn. That's how terrible sin truly is. And so that's what David is really saying in this verse. Now, to see that, we're going to look at it in its context by reading the psalm. So let's start back in verse 1, and let's talk about the restoration that David was pleading for and just how merciful and gracious God was to him. So verse 1, he says, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me throughly or thoroughly from mine iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. So when the psalm begins, David is begging for God's mercy. And we need, to, again, to recognize and to understand that David has acknowledged that what he did was wrong. That it was terrible, it was a sin against God, and there was no excuse for it. And he didn't make any excuses, and he didn't blame it on someone else. He didn't try to shift the focus to someone else. He said, it's my fault. I did this. I was wrong. And now he's pleading God's mercy. So he recognized his need for God. And we, of course, need to understand that. David was the king of Israel, but there was nothing that he could do with his power as king. He couldn't issue a royal decree that took away his sin. David had money and wealth and material possessions, but he couldn't have enough to buy the forgiveness of his sin. David's mighty men who fought by his side and defended him from all enemies weren't strong enough to give him the forgiveness of sin, to defeat this enemy for him. The only source that David had for help and for strength and for mercy was God. And so that's where he went. He went to Jehovah to beg for God's mercy. So even though he knows he's done terrible things, he also remembers that God is merciful. And God's covenant is a covenant of mercy. So he says, have mercy upon me according to thy loving kindness. That even though David had sinned, God still loved him and still had compassion for him. 
and he would demonstrate his love in his kindness toward David, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies. God is merciful, but his mercies are tender. He is gentle toward us. When we come to him humbly and honestly in penitence for our sins, God has tender mercies. And there's not just one or two, but a multitude of his mercies. Remember what Jeremiah wrote in Lamentations, they are new every morning. God's mercies are renewed with the beginning of every new day. And that's meant to say that they are never ending. God is always full of mercy. And that doesn't mean that we can flaunt his will and not receive justice, but it means that if we have a heart like David did, God will be merciful to us. Verse 2, he asked God to wash him, wash me thoroughly, inside and out, completely, fully, all the stains of this sin to be removed, to take every bit of it away. Wash me from my iniquity, he says, and cleanse me from my sin. Notice verse 3, he says, For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. So again, David admits that he was a sinner, that he'd done wrong, and that it weighed on him continually. It was ever in front of his eyes. He could continually see how, how terribly the things were that he had done. And he acknowledged it and he confessed it to God. And that was key to his being forgiven, to his receiving God's mercy. He had to be willing to see that he was wrong and to admit that to God. Then verse 4 says, Against thee, thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. And then he says, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. So notice how those two verses go together. David says, Against thee, thee only have I sinned. And that doesn't mean that he didn't sin against other people, because as we've noticed, obviously he did, against Bathsheba and certainly Uriah and against uh, his family and his nation and, and all those things. But ultimately it was against God. So when he says against thee and thee only, he doesn't mean that it's only against God. Just like when he says, I was shapen in iniquity, he doesn't mean that he was born a sinner. He's using these terms of exaggeration to talk about how terrible sin is and how all-encompassing and all-consuming it is, how it dominates our, our lives if we don't come out of it and repent of it and make it right with God. So he says his sin was against God, which is right. And so that's the one he went to for mercy and forgiveness. He says that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. So when you condemn me, God, it's the right thing to do because I have sinned. And I'm acknowledging my sin and that your will is right and just and, and holy. And so this punishment comes upon me. I deserve it. Because I've sinned. God's not doing something wrong. I'm the one who did wrong. And, and God is just and he's right. And then he says in verse 6, Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts. And in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. And so the key, the other key to, uh, to David's forgiveness is truth. God desires truth in the inward parts of man. That, of course, is in our heart of hearts. He wants us to be people of truth, but he wants us to know the truth. So why did God send Nathan the prophet to David? He, he could have just, you know, ignored it and said, you know, we don't need to confront David and let him, you know, go on thinking everything is okay. This is not going to be pretty. You know, it's not pleasant to confront someone with their sins. God sent Nathan because he wants truth in the inward parts, and David was living a lie. He was living the lie that everything was okay in his life when he had sin that had not been confessed to God. And God wants truth. And so Nathan told him the truth. David heard and accepted the truth. And now he's letting that truth into his heart, which will change his heart and then change his actions. And that's how God's word always works. It's how the gospel works. We hear it and it comes into our hearts and faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. So it's the hearing of God's word that creates faith. We have to let it in, but that truth will change us because it will change the way that we think, it will change the way that we feel, and of course it will change the way that we act. And that's what's happening to David. God's word is working in his heart. In the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. 
And again, that's what God was doing through his word, giving David wisdom in his heart that would guide his actions. So in verse 7, he asks God, Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. So think about these things. First of all, he says, purge me with hyssop. Hyssop was a small plant that was used uh, in, in various different ways in the, um, uh, in the Old Testament, and particularly in relation to the tabernacle. So in Exodus 12 and 22, when the um, uh, Passover was being observed, you would dip the hyssop in the blood, and then you would use that to put it on the doorpost around the house. Uh, when the tabernacle was dedicated, when the priests were dedicated, you dipped the hyssop in the blood, and then you would sprinkle the blood on the people with, with that plant. So when he says to purge me with hyssop, he wants God to cover him with blood. And, of course, the blood of bulls and goats can't take away sin. This is ultimately about the blood of Christ, but it hadn't come yet. But he's asking for forgiveness according to God's law for the day. So he says, purge me. And I shall be clean. Without shedding of blood, there's no remission. So David is pleading for the blood. Wash me, he says, and I shall be whiter than snow. Makes us think of Isaiah 1 in verse 18. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If God washes us, if God cleanses us, then our sins are completely removed and we're made absolutely pure. Nothing else has the power to take away our sins except for the blood of Christ. He says, make me to hear joy and gladness. And the, the key thing to notice here is when David says, make me to hear joy and gladness, gladness and joy, he has lost the ability to hear joy and gladness. There's no doubt joyful things happening around him, things that ought to make him glad, but there's no joy and there's no gladness in David's heart because there's sin in it. And as long as he tried to hide that sin and cover it up, even if he thought he'd gotten away with it, there was no joy in his life. He's now married to Bathsheba, you know, newlyweds and whatever. There's no joy in that marriage because of the situation that's taken place and because of David's sin. And, and on and on you could go. Everything happening in his life, good or bad, he doesn't have joy and gladness because of his sin. And it does the same thing to us. As long as it's there, our conscience is you know, constantly bothered by it, and we can never have true joy and true gladness. So David says, allow me to be able to hear again joy and gladness. Sin had robbed him of that, just as it does us. In verse 12, he says, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. With salvation comes joy. And David had lost his joy. Some have called this psalm the psalm where David lost his song. He couldn't sing songs of, of joy and gladness any longer because of his sin. So he wants God to restore the joy of salvation. He also says that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. And there are any number of places in the psalms where David uses this figure of speech about bones being broken and it has to do with the crushing weight of sin if man tries to carry sin on his own it ultimately crushes us into powder the new testament uses that idea it talks about christ as the chief cornerstone and it says if you stumble over that stone if you don't accept jesus as it as as that cornerstone then that stone's going to crush you grind you to powder that's what the truth of of, of god does when it comes to our sins. It's why Jesus said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Trying to carry around this burden of sin on your own. You're laboring and you're heavy laden. It's a weight that you cannot bear and carry, and it will break your bones and crush you and grind you into nothing. But the Lord can lift that burden and remove it, through the power of his blood. And that's what David is asking for, that his bones that have been broken can be restored. God will remove the weight of sin and once again give him strength. Notice verse 9, he says, Hide thy face from my sins and blot out all mine iniquities. It reminds us of Isaiah 59, 1 and 2. Verse 2 says, Your iniquities 
have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you. So sin causes us to be hidden from God's face. David didn't want to be hidden from God's face anymore. He wanted his sins to be hidden from God's face. So he's asking for forgiveness so he can come back into fellowship in the presence of God because his sins have been removed. And in doing so, his iniquities would be blotted out. Instead of David being blotted out, his sins are blotted out, and that allows him to be forgiven. And again, it's important to understand that sin separates man from God. And David recognized that, and he had felt it in the loss of joy and gladness in his life. But more than that, he knew it because it's the truth that God had revealed in his word. And so David, the man after God's own heart, had become separated from God by his sins. And we must understand that, that all sin separates us from God. Whether we think it does or not, whether the world says it's a, a bad sin or not, sin is sin, and it always severs our fellowship with God. That's why it's so important for us to confess our sins, to repent of our sins, and to ask God for forgiveness. And then look at verse 10. David says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. So David understood that what he needed, what, what he really needed, was for his heart to be cleansed. It's true that he'd done some terrible things. His actions had been wrong and sinful. But in order for his actions to be right, in the first place, his heart had to be right. Because what we do outwardly comes from who we are on the inside. And again, Jesus taught that very same principle. It's not the outward things, but those things come from within the man, within the heart. And so we have to guard our hearts, keep our hearts right. David needed a clean heart. His heart had been overcome with covetousness and with a lust, desire for things that he had no right to, and that had led him to commit those actions. So he needed to not do those actions, but he also needed to make his heart right. And that's what he asked God to do clean heart, he says, a right spirit. So again, sin is unclean and it's not right, it's wrong. But David could be cleansed and renewed. And then he says, cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. So again, sin separates us from God and David longed for that restoration. So the first word in verse 12 is restore. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. So David asked for restoration, restoration of his heart, restoration of his life, restoration of his joy. And again, the joy of thy salvation. Notice that it's thy salvation. Salvation comes from God. It's his, and he offers it to us. We can't create it on our own. God has to save us. And that's, you know, the New Testament. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans 6, 23. It's a gift. It's a free gift that God offers to us. And so it's his salvation. And when it comes from God, it's good and it's right and it's filled with joy. And so David, when he's restored, even though his, his newborn son has died, David can find joy and peace in his life because he knows that he's forgiven and he can go to be with him. He can see his son again. He can live in God's presence eternally in heaven because he's been restored. And that's what he's praying for and asking for in this psalm. Now, all of that kind of builds up to David's restoration, but we need to notice the end of the psalm. Here are the results of it. It's important to, to repent of our sins and to acknowledge our sins and to ask forgiveness, but our story doesn't end when we're forgiven. We have to bring forth fruits, meat for repentance. And here's what David says in verse 13. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. David says, I'm going to take what I have experienced and what I have learned, and I'm going to use it to teach others. Could David talk to someone about sin and how terrible it was? Absolutely, because he'd been there. He knew what it was like. Could he talk to someone about what it's like when you don't confess your sin and make it right with God, how it weighs upon you and destroys you? He could tell people that because he'd lived it. 
Could he tell them what it's like to find forgiveness and joy of salvation again? He could because this was his life. So David wasn't going to uh, allow this experience to just be something that happened and then forget about it. He was going to use it to serve God. So even the darkest moment in David's life becomes an opportunity to glorify God. He's going to use what he's been through and what he's experienced to teach others about what God did for him and just how merciful and gracious God is. And so David's going to teach others. He says in verse 14, Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, thou God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. God forgives David of his sins, and David doesn't just forget about God and walk away. Instead, he becomes a man who sings aloud praises of God, telling others about God's righteousness. All of these psalms that David wrote are written, number one, by inspiration, but number two, because this was a man who wanted to praise God. Even through his darkest moment in his life, Coming through the other side, he had a desire to sing aloud about God's righteousness. So again, he's going to take what he's gone through and use it to honor and to glorify God. Verse 15, O Lord, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. And then he says, For thou desiredst not sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O oh God, thou wilt not despise. And so David says, I understand that it's not just about the outward ritual. It's about what's in the heart. And God wants people with broken hearts. And not broken by sorrow, but broken by the fact that we're sinners and we can't save ourselves. We're totally dependent upon him. And so we come to him humbly and submissively on his terms and give ourselves to him completely and then use whatever we have, whatever he's blessed us with, whatever we've gone through to honor him, to praise him, to glorify him, and to teach others about him. And that's the kind of sacrifice that God is pleased with. And it doesn't mean they didn't have to offer animal sacrifices. They did, but it had to come from the right place. And that's what David is understanding, that his heart has to be right. And then he closes by saying, Do good in thy good pleasure unto Zion. Build thou the walls of Jerusalem. Then shalt thou be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offering and whole burnt offering. Then shall they offer bullocks upon thine altar. And so it ends with David, he's rebuilding Jerusalem, right? The walls and the city and the temple and all of that. So he's not going to stop the progress on what he was doing for God just because he sinned and because he fell. Yes, he made a terrible mistake and he did horrible things, but when he's forgiven of it and he's made it right, he goes back to work for God. Not perfect, and, and of course his reputation's not perfect and he'll have challenges to overcome and he's gonna have difficulties for the rest of his life, but he's not going to stop serving God and doing what he knows he's supposed to be doing. So we have in this Psalm David's restoration. He lost so much because of his sins. And for however long he tried to keep that hidden and, and covered up, he was suffering terribly on the inside. We, we read from Psalm 32 last time, and I'm going to flip over there and just read a couple of verses really quickly to, uh, to bring this to a, to a close. But the first verse of that psalm says, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. That verse is quoted in the New Testament in Romans 4 and verse 8. Paul says, Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. And then he asks this question, Cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision only, or upon the uncircumcision also? For we say that faith was reckoned unto Abraham for righteousness. How was it then reckoned? When he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision. Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. And he received the sign of circumcision and sealed the righteousness of the faith which he had, yet being uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto them also. And here's the key in verse 12. 
the father of the circumcision of them who are not of the circumcision only, but also who walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham, which he had being yet in circum in uncircumcised. So the, Paul's point there is that salvation was never intended to be just for the Jews. It was never just about whether you're circumcised or not. He says it's about the kind of faith that you have. God does not impute sin to people who have faith like that of Abraham. What was the faith of Abraham? Well, it was the kind of faith that when God said, leave your home and go to a place that I will show you, Abraham packed up and left. Had no idea where he was going, but he was going to go until God said stop. It's the kind of faith that when God says, take the son of promise up to the mountain and kill him, Abraham saddled his donkey and got his son and he went up the mountain, ready to, you know, drew the knife, ready to take Isaac's life. Why? Because he trusted God. That kind of faith is what allows us to have our sins forgiven. And David has come to understand that. He had to trust God that much, trust him enough to turn not only his life over to him, but to turn his sins over to him. We sometimes have the idea that we're going to live for God when we get all of our sins worked out. You know, when I overcome this and when I conquer this and when I defeat this and when I don't do this anymore, then I'm going to serve God. When I'm perfect, then I'll be ready to give myself to God. And it's never going to happen. We're never going to be perfect. We have to give ourselves to God as we are and trust him with our sins to forgive them and to help us and give us strength to overcome them. And that's what David had learned. He couldn't take this away on his own. He couldn't carry this burden on his own. He needed help, and God was the only source of help. And so that's to whom he went, acknowledging his wrongs, confessing his sins, repenting of them, having hatred in his heart toward those things that he'd done that hurt God, and pledging himself to not use them as an opportunity to sin again, but rather to use them as an opportunity to grow and to serve God, to praise him and to teach others about him and to keep on doing God's work. And because of that, David was forgiven of his sins. He was restored. The joy of salvation came back to him and he could truly live his life serving God, which he will continue to do, not perfectly, but he'll keep on serving God as king of, uh, of Israel. So I hope that we'll take that lesson with us and remind ourselves that sin is terrible, but God is merciful. And he will forgive if we come to him with humble hearts on his terms. God will take those sins away. And under the New Testament, it's even more powerful and, and beautiful and precious because of the blood of Jesus. That the price has already been paid that our sins can be forgiven. We just need to come to God to be cleansed by that blood. It requires uh, believing in Jesus, of course, after hearing the gospel, repenting of our sins, confessing his name as Lord and Savior, and then baptism for the remission of sins. Or for a child of God who has already done those things but gone off the, the straight and narrow path, become unfaithful to God. We, like David, need restoration. We have to repent. We have to confess our sins and ask God to forgive. His mercies are multiplied, and he will forgive us when we come to him with humble hearts, trusting and obeying just as he has commanded. If someone here needs to do that tonight, we pray that you'll make that decision, make things right with God so that weight can be removed. You can have the joy of salvation and eternal life in heaven. If you need to do that, come now, respond as we stand and as we sing. Why do you wait, dear brother?